Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna present to you the um, research we're doing currently on mapping land potential and uh, that in the framework of land uh, degradation assessments. So um, commonly when we assess land degradation, we need a baseline that we use to um, assess the state of the land against. And depending on what we use as the baseline, um, this assessment can change quite much. And I think this image visualizes that issue quite well. So if we only compare the um, state of the land right now to just very recent periods, we might think, oh, it's doing so much better or worse. Uh, but if we go further back, we see how bad it actually is doing or what it could potentially even be, um, which is commonly called the shifting baseline syndrome. So uh, commonly what is used as an indicator in land degradation is primary productivity. And um, here in the study, we propose to use this um, primary productivity as an indicator, but to assess the potential of the land. And land potential here means um, based on an analogous ecologically intact system. So meaning, um, um, what can the land be uh, in a dynamic equilibrium uh, instead of maximizing it for uh, yields for human needs? And this uh, research feeds into several OMC tasks. So it uh, can be part of the um, land potential mapper, the land degradation neutrality monitor, and also the biodiversity monitoring and reporting use case. So what we use here as an indicator for primary productivity is FA power, power power. Uh, it's a bit shorter. It stands for the fraction of absorbed photosynthetic active radiation. And it's one of the essential climate variables. It also um, can be related to biodiversity and it plays a key role in um, primary productivity modeling such the light use uh, efficiency equation that's used to um, estimate GPP. And what I'm showing you here is like the overall workflow that we used. So we started with um, time series data of FEPA from Ma et al, which have an eight day 250 meter spatial resolution time series from 2000 to 2021 available. And what we did is that we, sorry, we aggregated uh, this data to monthly uh, composites. And we used different uh, percentiles for that. And then we did uh, an overlay with training points. We used 12,500 uh, spatially distributed training points. And we overlaid them with a set of covariate layers. And from that regression metrics, then we trained on a machine learning model. Uh, we did some feature selection and we trained this model to predict uh, FAPA, like actual FAPA. Um, and then we used this model to project uh, the potential FAPA. So what would be the FAPA be if we remove some of the human impact? Um, then from that potential FAPA, we can calculate the difference between the actual and the potential to get the gap. And what we also did is to compute the long-term trend in the time series so that from both the trend and the gap together, we can uh, assess the state. And we um, aggregated this per land cover classes to get some metrics out of that. So here I show you the monthly FAPA time series that we aggregated from the glass FAPA version six. Uh, it covers the time period uh, March 2000 to end of 2021. And you can see here an example of a typical time series. Um, oh, yeah. Here you see um, the global training points. As you can see, they're where we distributed over the globe. Um, we didn't just randomly sample, but we did a stratified approach to uh, make sure that we also cover specific areas of human impact, of land cover change. Um, and also areas where all the human pressure is um, like uh, very low to make sure that these areas are included as well. And then we uh, did some general exploration of the FAPA time series with some 
uh, other parameters to just explore how does it behave. And here we plotted against like uh, EVI, the enhanced vegetation index, uh, and land surface temperature, and we see some common relationships. But we also see that the variability in the range can be quite uh, wide, and it's not always easy to estimate if it apart from only one parameter. So then here you see the covariate data we actually used in our model because of course we cannot use something like EVI because uh, we want to predict the potential FA bar and not what it is just currently. So what we are using here is uh, topographic data, climate data, um, data on the landform and the solid team. We also use some vegetation indicators and then specific human pressure variables, which in this case are the human footprint index night lights, population count, and cropland intensity. So what we did then from these overlaid training points, so they're overlaid with the whole time series data. So this resulted in about um, 10 million points from which we then subset 3 million points for the training to speed up the time. Um, we did some recursive feature elimination with uh, cross-validation. And we trained on an ensemble machine learning model. So we have three sub models in there, extremely randomized trees, gradient descended trees, and an artificial neural network. And we used a linear regressor to stack them. This was implemented using the scikit map library. Maybe you heard of it already the last days, uh, which is built on scikit-learn. We did uh, some hyper -tu tuning of those models, um, selecting the best parameters. And we did the evaluation using five-fold spatial cross-validation. So we always uh, made sure that uh, geographic locations are only either in the training or in the test data set. Here you see some results of the um, evaluation. And we um, assessed the data uh, also against an independent test data set. And uh, we found an R-square of about 0 0.9. Um, and the uh, important variables that were used in the model were the growing season lengths, the forest indicator map, and uh, the bioclim 12, which is the annual precipitation. So this was the model to estimate the actual uh, FAPA, which we then used to predict the potential FAPA. And we did that by removing the impact of urbanization and intensive agriculture by setting the human pressure variables that we use to zero values. So the human footprint index, the population count, night lights, goblin intensity, we uh, used uh, and put them to zero to see what is then the FAPA in the same location. And then for the vegetation cover, we used the potential biome distribution um, to estimate which would be uh, uh, in, uh, basically naturally uh, the biome in that location. And here you can see some uh, global composites of that for the year 2021. So these are monthly imagery from January to December 2021. And you can see, especially in Europe, for example, uh, that also the potential for our changes with the seasons. So from that, we have the actual FAPA, the potential FAPA, and from that, of course, we can calculate the gap between the two. Um, so on the left, you see uh, the potential subtracted from the actual, so red values mean basically that the uh, potential is lower than the actual. Um, and on the right here, you see the model deviance that comes from the ensemble model for the predictions, and I think what you can also see is that maybe here yeah, a lot of the savanna areas show like a potential lower than the actual, but if you look at the model deviance map, you also see that especially those areas have a high deviance value. So it's good to be also cautious about the results and really see what is uh, happening in the model there. Um, uh, on the other hand, you see areas that have uh, actual far lower than potential have generally a lower model deviance, like in, in Europe, for example. We also looked specifically at areas of irrigation where we expect the potential far part to be lower than the actual because um, of the irrigation, of course. Um, here you see the Nile area and you can really see that uh, the model does uh, pick that uh, human pressure variable up and take it into account. 
Um, yeah, I'm showing you some local uh, examples. So you can see the time series from 2000 to 2021 for three different areas. And in the top, you see an, uh, it's a reforestation project in Colombia. And you can see that uh, the actual FAPA here in red is increasing over time, while the potential FAPA basically was high already the entire time. Um, in the second one, you see a deforestation pattern in Brazil, where you can see also that it goes down um, over time. And then the other thing we did was to calculate the trend uh, from 2000 to 2021, to then be able to have for each location the trend, but also the gap. And uh, you can see here also some patterns in it. You see um, in your India and China, I think they're also often in the news about uh, regreening, uh, which might be a lot due to agriculture as well. Um, so that's why it's also good to uh, always look at the gap at the same time. Um, yeah. And you will look again at uh, those same examples, uh, about the trend. And I also show you here the land cover change map. So we can see for this reforestation project, uh, there's a positive trend here. And also the land cover maps pick that up. And here you see the land surface temperature from what is. Um, and you see there, uh, as we expect, the land surface temperature goes down. Um, and uh, the vice versa, basically, for the deforestation, we see also some uh, increase in the land surface temperature. And with these kind of combinations, we can also look at where there is actual land cover change and maybe increase or decrease in land surface temperature or vice versa. Lastly, we aggregated those metrics um, for the gap and the trend. For, um, so for the gap, we show here the average for 2021. And uh, I'm showing you here our classes that were stable between 2000, 2021, so start and end. Um, and with this uh, kind of rich plot, you can see the distribution of the gap, like, um, like going more to the left, the bigger the gap and the more values, it's like a, a distribution, basically, the more it goes vertically up, the more values you can find in that part. Um, and then for the trend also, we can see that in blue, there's a lot of positive trends, um, but also we can see some classes that stick out with negative trends. So some limitations I want to highlight of this is um, that um, our model did not explain all the variation in FAPAR, plus uh, we use a spatial resolution of 250 meters. So of course we have some mixed pixels in there. Um, also we neglect here the effect of vegetation on the climate, right? Like if there um, has not been a forest and then there is a forest that will also change the conditions. Um, also, a higher uh, actual FAPA than the potential does not necessarily mean that the land improves uh, and vice versa. And um, yeah, I think we need uh, robust frameworks to estimate the probability distribution to really quantify the um, uncertainty also of the model. And lastly, um, of course, our model is also subject to the shifting baseline syndrome since we basically compare uh, spatially, but uh, we cannot go like uh, to prehistoric times right now with the data we used in this model. Um, so um, the approach we use here, um, we use a, a single model that is fitted for the entire space-time cube. Um, and with this, we can assess uh, potential land degradation from two sides, from having a declining trend, but also a difference between the actual and potential vegetation. It's a framework that can be applied on country and project level. And we could apply this methodology to also predict uh, FAPA for the future climate to already take that into account for land restoration today. Then following up our research will include to um, go more in depth into the model to do a um, sensitivity analysis of the model and look how it performs for different ecosystems. Maybe we should include some more um, additional layers. Um, for example, the not just annual precipitation or monthly, but using the presentation really from the last three to six months, uh, which are maybe more indicative of uh, drought conditions. 
Um, also to actually assess land degradation, we need to incorporate this uh, gap and the trend data with other layers like soil organic carbon or the water table. And lastly, um, um, we would uh, test how this will work for future climate uh, scenarios. Now, uh, we submitted uh, a publication to uh, PayJ and uh, we will make the preprint available. The data is openly available on Zenodo. You can find it in these uh, links. And also we make the code available on GitHub. And lastly, uh, Tom will have a workshop later, I think downstairs after this box session. And he will also show uh, you how you can access the data, how you can already play around with it and look at maybe areas you know, uh, how is the data in that specific uh, region. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Does anyone have a question for Julia? Hi, uh, thanks for a very cool presentation. Um, I know that you worked really hard to finish this in order to be able to present it. Um, so I have a question, like if you would had more time, I'm sure that you have like a list of things in your head that you would have done better, like that you would like to invest more time in. So what is like the number one on your list? Mm -hmm. Number one probably would be to increase the spatial training point sample size. Now we have like 12,000 points and the whole time series. So it will uh, result in a lot of unique time space points, but it would be great to cover like even more geographical locations. Like for example, in the summer and it's also to see how much are they covered and to do that in depth analysis uh, with each ecosystem. Yeah, to really look at how each of them is uh, performing. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we don't have another time for much questions. So if you have any other question, you can meet Yulia after this and I'm sure she will take your questions, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs>